Well, good afternoon. I appreciate you joining us here again for another episode of The Fireplace Show. And today we're going to be talking about something that affects so many fireplaces, so many chimneys across America, and that is water entry issues and how this shortens the life of so many chimneys and causes rebuilds, massive repairs and other things and the preventative steps that you can go through. So stay with us and we'll be with you and we'll be back in just a minute. And at that point, we're going to start the show. So appreciate you joining me today. My guest today, Stuart Karanovich from Saver Systems, is having some computer issues. So hopefully he's gonna be able to join us here in just a minute and be able to bring some of his subject matter expertise into the show for us today. But I appreciate you joining us because here's Stuart coming in now. So hopefully I'm gonna try to add him in at this point. So let's see if we get Stuart onto this stream. Stuart, are you there with me, brother? Well, I think I, I finally am, Jerry. Thanks a lot. Congratulations. So like I said, as I was just telling our audience today, we're going to talk about water entry issues. And I was just telling them that my guest today was having a little bit of computer issues and, and hopefully you'll be on in a minute. So Stuart, let's start out. Let's tell folks a little bit about yourself and your background uh, of going into this industry. Okay, sir. Sure. Uh, first off, Jerry, thanks a lot for having me on. Um, as most of you may know, I work for Saber Systems. Um, I've been working with them for the last 17 years. Um, we're the We Fix Leaky Chimneys people. And um, our founder and CEO, John Meredith, um, pretty much started the water remediation in masonry chimneys business about 40 years ago when he started Saber Systems and launched it with our first product, Chimney Saver. Yeah. And you know, Stuart, that was I like a turning point. I met John <clears throat> somewhere in the late 80s. I don't remember the exact year, but he had just come out with this new product line called Chimney Saver. And at the time, the industry really didn't look at water entry as the issue that we found it to be today. Through the research that we do and everything, today we find that water entry and the resultant damage from this is probably the number one threat to the survival of masonry materials and masonry chimneys. So would you agree with what I'm saying there that water entry is a major, major issue that causes millions of dollars in needed repairs every single year? So you hit the nail right on the head, Jerry. Um, a lot of people think that, uh, you know, that, 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 that maybe a, a chimney fire or lightning strikes or creosote, because we hear so much about those types of uh, issues, uh, would be the reason that their masonry chimney would fail, but that's not true. The number one reason that a masonry chimney will fail is water. And closely related, related to that water would be the freeze-thaw cycles um, that most of the country goes through uh, time and again, year after year. Right. So what we're going to do, we are speaking to consumers today. And even though we have a lot of chimney sweeps, a chimney service companies in the country that watch our show, what we're doing is we're trying to put this in the terms for consumers to understand. And we're going to share with you some of the things that you can look for on your own chimney that may alert you that you need to get expertise in to look at this, to diagnose it, to come up with a strategy for resolution of the water entry issues. So we're gonna to touch on that. So the first thing we wanna cover here is, is what are the things that you as a consumer can look for? And one of the leading things is gonna to go to the top of the chimney. And the top of the chimney should have what we call a chimney crown. So Stuart, you wanna explain what chimney crowns are? And you've done a lot of training of technicians over the last few years of how to actually pour and install a proper chimney crown. So let's tell consumers that they're standing in the yard, looking up at their chimney, how do they tell from the ground if they have a proper chimney crown? Well, Jerry, they don't even have to look to the, from the ground to tell if they have a proper chimney crown. All you gotta take a look is your background. Uh, I'm looking at your green screen background back there, and you got about 10, chim 10 chimneys back there that have horrible crowns on them. 
Um, but anyway, uh, if you're looking at those, the first thing that you should notice if you're looking from the ground is that your chimney crown should actually overhang the actual chimney itself. Um, for homeowners that aren't aware that the, the crown is actually the thing on the very top, uh, should be made out of concrete and it should overhang in all four directions by at least two and a half inches. That's the first thing that you should see. Correct. And I want you to think of this way. If you've ever walked in the rain and you had an umbrella, if the umbrella didn't cover your shoulders and didn't cover your body good, you're going to get wet. And that's one of the purposes of the chimney crown. And like Stuart said, it should be bigger than the chimney where the water, when it runs off the chimney, doesn't run down the chimney structure. Rather, it runs completely off of the chimney. And one of the things is, Stuart, around the country, there is a lot of chimneys that don't have actual crowns made to the Brick Institute of America standards. They have what we call a crown wash or a crown splay. So let's tell people, because as you look at those chimneys behind me, those are basically crown washes and crown splays that you can see over my shoulder. So That's explain right. what the pro what we're talking about here and what the problem is with this, Stuart. Well, I, I think the problem is exactly what you said, Jerry. Uh, you know, having a crown uh, or a wash or a splay more correctly, like the ones that you see in your background, uh, allow the water to actually, uh, the purpose of a crown is to stop water from sheeting down. One of the uh, one of the reasons you have a crown is to stop the water from sheeting down the face of the masonry structure that is your chimney. Um, when you have a crown or a splay that is formed the way that that the ones you see there or that don't have the overhang, all they do is collect rainwater and wash it right down the face of the chimney. Um, I'm sure that we've all drove by houses where we see chimneys and the top three, four, five rows of bricks seem like they're just stacked there and there's no mortar in there anymore. Um, basically, that's what happens. The water just keeps running through it, running through it, and it washes the mortar away. And pretty soon you have uh, chimney failure and then it gets really expensive to fix. Right. Now, also, if you look over my shoulders at the chimney, if you look right over my left shoulder, you'll see a chimney that has brick that project out. And that's what we call corbling. And one of the issues here, as the water comes down the chimney, if you have this, <coughs> excuse me, if you have a chimney that the brick actually gets wider than the chimney itself, this is like a ledge that catches that water. And a lot of times we even see the brick holes, the cores in the brick are exposed where the water can go right inside of the chimney through there. Would you agree with that, Stuart? I would absolutely agree with that. And, and the reason uh, for any of the listeners um, that live in areas where the temperature drops below freezing, the top of that brick where it's cordled out, this is a purely aesthetic move by the mason that built your chimney. It doesn't serve any purpose other than aesthetics. Uh, as a matter of fact, it, it's actually uh, to the detriment of the longevity of the chimney because water will sit on the top of that ledge. And then as the temperature drops, that water will freeze and then it will start working its way into the chimney. It'll start a little crack and more water gets in there. It freezes and expands again and the crack gets bigger. And then pretty soon you've got some expensive damage to fix. Correct. Now that is a term that you said a while ago, which is what we call freeze thaw. So would you explain to our listeners when we say the word freeze thaw, what is happening here and how does freeze thaw cycles cause damage over a period of time, Stuart? Well, it's actually pretty simple, um, but um, I like to use the bread analogy. Um, when brick gets wet, the, the, the way that a brick normally dries is that the, the, the water passes through the brick in the form of a vapor. And when it reaches the outside of the chimney or the brick itself, then the wind, the sun, the temperature of the day, will wick that moisture away and it will continue to do that until the brick dries out. The problem is, is that if the brick gets wet because of improper chimney construction or, or other or damage um, and that water vapor doesn't completely exit the brick, as the temperature drops, that water vapor turns into a small water droplet. And then as the temperature drops even farther, that water droplet turns into a small ice crystal and when it does that, that ice crystal expands and it pushes out and it, and it actually forms a, 
or it actually creates a large amount of pressure on the face of the brick. A lot of people may look at their chimney and they'll notice that you can see that the whole face of the brick or a large portion of the face of the brick is either at the base of your chimney or laying on your roof. And people wonder, why does that happen? The reason that happens is because you have water damage with freeze thaw damage and the brick, when they're manufactured, they're put into big kilns and they're baked much the same way a loaf of bread is. The crust on a bread is bread, just like the facing on a brick is brick, but the facing on a brick is harder. And when you get that pressure from the inside, it pops off and it's pretty ugly damage. And there's really no way to fix that besides taking out the affected brick and replacing them. Right. And that's a, that's a form of damage we call spalling. Whenever we have a piece of brick on and the, and the face of it, the surface comes off and pops off from this force, that is spalling. And the reason we want you to understand that, if you have a technician look at your chimney and they say it's spalling, what they're talking about is the face of the brick is actually popped off and exposed rougher edges underneath. You can also have a sand finished brick that the sand finish can come off and you'll see discoloration on the chimney. Now, one of the things that we teach in the industry and both Stuart and myself have instructed a lot of people over the years in diagnostics and analysis of these problems. Okay, so this is a really big thing for the chimney industry. And one of the things that we teach home inspectors, I had a class last week of home inspectors, and we talked about water entry a lot, Stuart, was this coloration of the chimney. And when you look again, if you look over my right hand shoulder right now, you'll see a chimney there with one pipe sticking out the top. And on that chimney, and we're talking about this side over here. And what you're looking at, you see where the bricks start to turn a different color. It's kind of like it's mildewing or molding. And that is showing you that water is being retained in that chimney. And one of the things you talk about in a class that you recently did for Stuart was water permeance. So let's talk about what water permeance means whenever we talk of, when you do the class, what are we talking about in water permeance? Well, what, one of the things, you know, most people were brought up on, on uh, you know, we all listened to fairy tales when we were kids. And one of the biggest ones they heard was the uh, three pigs. And uh, they built their house out of sticks or straws and, the, and then the wolf blew it down and then they built it out of brick and it lasted forever. And that's exactly what that is, is a fairy tale. Um, brick is basically a heavy sponge. Our eyes are very weak instruments, even if you have 20-20 vision. If you look at a brick underneath a, a microscope, what you'll find it is, is nothing more than a network of um, interconnected capillaries and pores. And they will, a, a, an average brick is capable of absorbing one cup of water. So if you go out and take a look at your chimney and just do a rough count of the bricks or take an estimation, and then think about all the cups and how that leads to quarts and gallons, that's water permeance in a masonry chimney. Okay, so got you covered there. So again, as consumers, here's some of the things to look for. Look up at your chimney from the ground. We're looking for that concrete crown to overhang the edges. And Stuart, you said two and a half inches. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Okay. The next thing we're looking for that you mentioned was looking for brick that step out. In other words, you look at the chimney, it gets towards the top and the chimney gets bigger, which creates these flat ledges on top of it. So that's what we call exterior corbelling. And when you have these corbelling is that that's also a water entry point. Would that be correct? Absolutely. OK, then and we're also telling you, look at the chimney itself, looking for discoloration. Now, I mentioned a while ago, darkened staining and blackish staining. But Stuart, we also have a whitish staining that is called efflorescence. Can you right. explain what efflorescence is when people see and what this will look like is someone has took almost like white paint and painted in sections of your chimney. It won't be the whole thing. It'll be in different areas. So what is efflorescence coming from? What causes it, Stuart? Well, um, water permeance in the chimney is what causes efflorescence. And basically efflorescence is 
mineral and metallic salts that are brought to the surface. Remember when I talked about how a brick dries naturally, it gets wet and the water vapor moves through the brick in the, in the form of a vapor and it gets to the surface and it's wicked off and it's dried. Well, as it travels through the brick in some brick, it will pick up the mineral and metallic salts and it will deposit them on the surface. If you see this type of damage on your chimney, the first thing that needs to do is the efflorescence obviously needs to be removed for, for aesthetic purposes. But other than that, what it is doing is giving you a big major clue that you need to have somebody qualified, take a look at it and figure out where the water is entering your chimney, because this is like a warning sign. This is like the tea kettle that starts whistling that tells you it's fixing to start boiling. Gotcha. So let's keep going. Now, Stuart, sometimes we have chimneys and as you look at them, we'll say it's a two story house or it may be a one story house. And as you look towards the bottom, as you get closer to where the fireplace is, a lot of times the chimney gets bigger by angles on sometimes on one side of the chimney, some si sometimes it's on both sides of the chimney. And this is what we call the chimney shoulders or the ex exterior corbels is what that is. Is this a water entry point here where the chimney gets wider coming out, Stuart? It absolutely is. And um, this is another design characteristic um, that didn't really take into account um, the survivability of the chimney in the elements. Uh, whenever you see these, a lot of times you'll see discoloration underneath them. Many, many times you'll see microbial growth, mold, um, algae growing on these things. And they need to be addressed quickly because that's one of the easiest ways that a chimney will bring water into your living space. Right. Now, Stuart, as we look at these exposed areas, and if you and I were up closely evaluating this situation, we'll say we're at the home and we're a foot away from this. Often we find separations between the brick and the mortar where the water has gotten into it. It's caused the stress of the freeze thaw and separates the bricks. And one of the things that you need to be aware of is water problems are never going to go away. Often I talk about when you have a small problem, it's going to become small, but then the issue will accelerate and means it's going to get worse. So each and every time that we have this freeze thaw and the chimney is wet, what we're going to do is we're going to repeat this expansion. So at the beginning, we may just have this expansion that we can only see with a microscope. But then after a period of time, these these pla these places get bigger and bigger till finally we can actually see brick falling off the chimney. Would you agree with what I'm saying here? I would agree with what you're saying. And if you give me a little latitude here, I'd, I'd like to talk to the talk, uh, speak to the difference of preventive and corrective maintenance. Hey, you got all the latitude in the world, man. All right. Well, I come from a military background and the equipment that I worked on in the military had to work when it needed to work. And so I spent 85% of my time doing preventive maintenance because we knew that the equipment will break down. So you groom it and you make sure that it doesn't break down at the most inopportune moment. Um, a lot of people, whenever we're dealing with water remediation and masonry chimneys, only take action after they have some type of occurrence. And if you wait until after something happens, then you are by definition chasing the curve. And once you start chasing the curve, it's ultimately harder to fix it and almost always multitudes more expensive to fix it. So what we need to do is we need to listen to Masons and a Mason, a true Mason will tell you that it is not a question of if a masonry structure, chimneys included, will leak. It's a question of when. And so if we take preventive maintenance and actually treat the crown the chimney itself and the flashing, which are the three main contributors to water uh, coming into a home and causing damage, then we can do it inexpensively and we can stop the type of damage that may cost us thousands and thousands of dollars down the line if we choose to ignore it. Right. So Stuart, let me ask you if you agree with the statement that I'm getting ready to make. And if you don't agree, that's fine. But I feel like that the American construction industry doesn't recognize how to make these structures water repellent. 
So what's happening is, is we have millions of structures built across the United States that these preventative measures were not taken into account at the time of construction. Would you agree with that statement? So I would agree 100%. And I think that if you ever talk to a real Mason, that you would have absolutely no, no trouble finding uh, a lot of them that would agree with you. When you look at um, all of the brick buildings and all the block buildings and all the cement buildings, go downtown anywhere, wherever you live, any town USA, and take a look at those buildings. The Masons that built those buildings built in avenues for the water to leave that structure without doing damage. I'm not going to go into uh, the multitude of ways that they do that. But for some reason, when they built chimneys, they didn't do it. And if you actually look at a chimney, is it not functionally the same as a small building? It has four sides. It has a top. It has a bottom. So we should build in areas for water to exit the system. Um, and when you get a knowledgeable chimney sweep or a knowledgeable mason, you'll find those things. But, but they are quite uncommon. Right. Now, another substance that's out here that's not brick is many times uh, builders will use, we can call them concrete block, we can call them uh, modular block, we can call them different things, but it's built out of a concrete block that's formed at a block plant and they're laid up. This is also underneath many of the brick. So when we talk about a concrete block, do we look at it differently? Is it more water repellent than brick or is it more is it more apt to suck in the water into a concrete block, Stuart? So there are exceptions, but as a general rule, these are going to be a bigger problem than a regular uh, brick and mortar chimney. Uh, the reason being is that, remember when we talked about the capillary and pore structure of brick, if you go to concrete block, you'll find that the capillary and pore uh, uh, structure of that substrate is actually quite larger um, than it is in brick and mortar. And so when you're uh, choosing a product to treat those, you need to make sure that you get a product that is built to treat those because the capillary and the pore structure is much different. Gotcha. Now, okay, so what we've talked about here is things that you can look at as a consumer on your own chimney, okay? And also, this is something that your technician may share with you. But most time, we don't look up at chimneys unless you're in the chimney business. I mean, Stuart, myself, we probably ride down the road and look at chimneys all the time because that's what's on our minds. Probably lucky we hadn't been killed at this point in the life in a wreck looking at some <laughs> chimney that jumped out up there. So anyway, this is what we're trying to do is help you to see. And you may be looking at purchasing a home, okay? Or you may be having a chimney sweep coming out. But some of the things of water entry into chimneys and the damage and the problems that occur. So Stuart, the first one I want to deal with, when we have water entry into a masonry chimney, and most masonry chimneys are lined with a material that we call flue liner, which is vitreous clay tile put together in 12 inch or 24 inch sections. And in between this, we have a mortar joint laid. And many times water entry into a chimney will eradicate and flush that mortar out from between flue tiles. So we get a chimney that may be 15, 20 years old and all of a sudden this material which is a gasketing material is actually now completely flush from the system and this results in potential leakage of flue gases into the house and performance issues where the fireplace doesn't operate properly. So you agree with what I'm saying that water entry can eradicate those joints between those flue tiles? I, I uh, so you finally said something that I don't fully agree with. Okay. And, uh, and uh, the only thing that you said was, you know, 10 to 15 years, because I've seen houses seven years old that had the problem that you're talking about. Okay. And, and it is water. You're absolutely correct. Um, but the other thing is, is that, you know, the reason that we have somebody sweep our chimney is because whenever we burn solid fuel, we never get complete combustion. And these unburned particulates what they do is is they they form on the side walls of that flue pipe that you were talking about and in the presence of water they form a sulfuric acid and that acid actually eat, not only does the water wash those joints out but the sulfuric acid accelerates that and eats those joints out the codes changed in 1987 and um since then you were not supposed to be able to build a flue 
and that gasketing material that you're talking about should be made of a non-water soluble refractory cement, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is. Um, and so, like you said, then it becomes a danger issue because the stated purpose of a flue is to safely convey the byproducts of combustion to the outside of the home. If you have holes in that around where your mortar should be um, and you let flue gases out into that chase, you have no idea where they're going after that. Right. And I'm not going to disagree with your seven year time frame. We're actually in agreement. <laughs> the thing is, yes, right. it does happen. But a lot of times when we look at it, but I also want you to listen carefully to what Stewart said, which it was only in the late 80s, 1980s, when the material that was specified between the flue tiles was more impervious to these acids and these waters that, that were enter, entering into the chimney. So if your home was built prior to 1990, I think that Stu and I would agree that you can more than likely have an improper mortar that's not going to give you a long life. And today, Stuart, we're talking over 40 years ago, and that's why we see a lot of issues with this, right? Absolutely, 100%. Now, Jay Walker just brought up, and this is also performance problems with gaps between the liners. See, today we've got a couple different technicians that are watching our show. Jay was from Tallahassee, Florida that came in, good friend of ours. This is Jesse Hersey, and he is a technician working in Wichita, Kansas. And you can see all brick stone and masonry absorbs water. So again, it is recognized very heavily in the industry. So let's tell folks about another place that they can see it without a ladder, because again, that's where, you know, when we talk about the missing mortar between the flue tiles, that's something that's going to take a technician more than likely with a video inspection device to lower into the chimney and see it. Now, it can be so bad that a skilled technician, yes, we can see those gaps. Okay, Stuart, you and I, but we're experienced in looking at this. So if, you, if that's a concern, that's going to come down to having the right technician there. But one of the things is, that a lot of people it will have a firebox there where you burn the wood. And as you look at the firebox, you're gonna see that the brick are splitting, the brick are spalling like we talked about. The firebox is just deteriorating. And often this is gonna be traced to the water entry and draining down into that firebox area where it softens the brick and ends up causing damage. Again, what we're doing is heating that water up. When we, build, when we heat the water up, we make steam. So am I on track with what I'm telling people to look at for in their fireplaces, Stuart? Absolutely. And, and even if you don't have an open hearth, if you have an insert, um, you may not see the firebox deterioration. But if you pull that stove out, you may see it's rusting through. Yeah. And a lot of times you get a lot of rust on those things and then they become unusable and need to be replaced. Correct. So again, you got to remember, this is something and this is not promotion by the industry. You know, the standard of care of chimneys goes down to NFPA and in their 211 standard. And NFP stands for the National Fire Protection Association. And the National Fire Protection Association recommends that every chimney, no matter what you're bending through it, whether it's your furnace, your water heater, your fireplace, your wood stove, whatever, that it be inspected on an annual basis. Not necessarily that it needs to be swept or clean, rather that an expert needs to look at this. And NFPA specifies that you've got to have a qualified agency doing this. And a qualified agency has to meet certain criteria according to NFPA 211. So, Stuart, would you agree that this is what you and I have both taught for many years of how to spot these issues and how to correct them and how to build a strategy for correcting these issues? I would agree with you 100%, Jerry, 100%. Okay. That's good. So Stuart and I are in agreement, which we don't agree on everything, as you heard earlier, but at the same time, when it gets down into the basics and preservation. Now, another thing that goes on whenever we get water in chimneys is it causes odors. And many times people will report what we call stinky chimneys in the summertime. And where this is coming from is the chimney gets wet. And then in certain pressure conditions, it pulls the air down the flue into the home through the damper. And when you get around your chimney, it just literally stinks. So is stinky chimney a problem here, Stuart? Absolutely it is. And uh, a lot of people suffer with that. Uh, and there's a lot of things that we can do for it. Um, but one of the biggest things that we can do is eliminate the water because what it's actually doing, um, not only like you said, we get the temperature inversion and instead of the smoke coming up, 
the smell comes down. Um, and it usually happens in the summer when it's warmer in the house than it is in the outside. And normally when you're building a fire, obviously, it's warmer at the bottom and colder outside. Um, those problems are made worse um, by the fact that we have those unburned particulates on the inside of our flu system. And when they get wet, they stink. That's it. So here's the whole thing. Some years ago, the company that Stuart works for, the name of the company is Saver Systems. And Saver Systems, basically, there you go, just like on this app. So Saver Systems makes a lot of maintenance problems, products, not just for masonry, but Stuart, y'all also manufacture products to protect wood, such as decks and other things. Am I correct? Sure. OK, so that, you know, one of the things that this company does is they produce products to help in the maintenance of the home and also in the repair of these issues. So one of the things that they have produced is a checklist. And Stuart, on this checklist, I've got a I got a copy printed off here. We got 31 points of concern of water entry on this ceiling. So some of these things will be honest with you. You're going to have to get onto the roof to check these. One of the problems we have here, you've got where pseudo materials used for the base flashing and counter flashing. Is it flashing? Is the flashing bent or missing? So there's really no way to see this one from the ground. Would that be correct, Stuart? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And also what, let's tell them what counter flashing is because a lot of people may not know this, but this is a big water entry issue where we don't have a good seal between the home and the chimney. And many times the water can go right between these two gaps and get into the lower ports of the chimney. So anything you would share with our listeners on flashing and counter flashing? Well, um, flashing is a lost art. Uh, unfortunately, um, there's not a lot of people that do it and the people that do it, not all of them do it well. And anytime the, uh, according to the brick industry association, which is where I get a lot of my, uh, walking points from, um, anytime you have dissimilar materials that pass through the envelope of your home, you need to have flashing. And, uh, it's just funny that sometimes you see base flashing without any counter flashing. And sometimes you see counter flashing without any base flashing. And so I think there's just a lot of people that, that don't um, understand what flashing is. Um, but the big thing is, is that you need to make sure that you do have flashing because there's a thing called a temperature coefficient. And when you take a look at where your chimney actually passes through the envelope of your home, you may have brick and mortar, or you may have block and mortar and then you have wood you may have metal you may have terracotta you could have four five six different things that will expand and contract at different rates given the same amount of heat or cold you know from the atmosphere and so what happens is is as these things expand and contract at different rates they create gaps albeit temporary that allow water to get into your home and so, you know, at, a di at, at different temperatures, you can have different holes in different parts of your envelope, uh, if you will. And so you need to make sure that your flashing is done well. Um, and if it's not, then there are products that you can use as a homeowner to actually fix these things that are pretty easy to, to take care of. Right. Now, as I read this checklist, and so you'll know, I put a link up there. If you copy that link, you can actually get this checklist right off of your website. Correct, Stuart? That's right. So as I look through the next five, seven different things, it involves the mortar joints and the bond of the mortar joints to the brick. Is this a big issue where water can get into a chimney through an improper bond of the mortar using improper mortars or not well bonded to the to the brick itself? Is that a part of water entry issues? Oh, absolutely. Um, if, if it, it, you know, the three biggest things that will are the most important things that will determine whether or not your chimney is going to be able to withstand the forces of mother nature i.e water um, is um, quality of workmanship design and uh, the the proper um, materials um, i worked on a chimney yesterday in pennsylvania um, where they had just these ungodly 
uh, mortar joints. And all that did was brought water into the house. And so we had to do a water remediation uh, a job on that and, uh, and make sure that it wasn't taking on water. But, you know, again, the mortar was done in a decorative fashion, not in a fashion that was conducive to that structure lasting. Right. So a lot of times what we see, we call them squeeze joints where the mortar actually oozes out of the brick and they never tool the joint off. Tooling right. means where you're taking a striking tool. And this is part of it. It's like even the mortar joint itself from an improper joint being improperly tooled. Is that a problem with water permeance? Stuart? Absolutely. It okay. absolutely is. So as I go down through here, the next one is something that a lot of people may not consider. And that is one of the products that you sell is vent tubes. And that is to allow ventilation of the area between the clay flue lining and the top of the chimney. Whenever, or excuse me, the sides of the chimney. It's like when you see those clay pipes sticking out of the chimneys above behind me, as that flue liner goes through, once it gets under that chimney crown, there's supposed to be a gap in there. It should be at least a half an inch and no more than four inches. But a lot of times water builds up and condensation builds up there. So what we've got to do is install vent tubes into the chimney, which very few people are going to find in their chimneys to allow this condensation to escape. So what would you add about vent tubes and how effective these are in helping to stop condensation forming in the chimney, Stuart? Well, they're super effective and they last a lifetime and they're relatively inexpensive. Um, I liken it to a cold drink on a hot day. Take a uh, glass of ice water out on your porch next time it gets really hot and pretty soon you'll find water dripping down the sides of it. Um, stop and think about that terracotta flu liner that you see over Jerry's shoulders there. In the winter, that thing is warm because you've got a fire and you've got hot flue gases going up it. But if the chimney itself is oversized and there's a lot of extra space in there, then what you have is a bunch of cold air. And so you start getting condensation and it'll drip down the outside of that pipe. Some of it will find its way into the pipe and the rest of it will find its way down into either your firebox, into your drywall, uh, maybe onto your stove, depending on what you've got down there. And the reverse is, is, is true during the winter. Um, during the winter, it's hot and it's cold. In the summer, it's cold and then it's hot. So it, it, it really doesn't give, uh, there's no season that actually gives it a break. And so if your chimney is improperly designed, if you vent your chimney with these vent tubes, then it equalizes the pressure the inside and the outside of the chimney and stops that condensation from forming. Okay. Jesse, there's a customer in Wichita and I believe it is a home safe customer. And if you look on the screen right now, she would like you to send her the link to this. So if you'll contact me after this, I'll send you the link direct to you and you can forward to that because it looks like that's one of your customers requesting this shit, this sheet right here. Okay. So sure, then Jesse, maybe. huh? Cute baby. There you go. And then he says they cut in or embed flashing are horrible. We remove that every time and put a counter flashing over it. Because one of the things is HomeSafe does a really good job on chimneys out there in Wichita. Bart's the owner of that. Bart and I go back many, many years. And I know we're broadcasting live right now over Bart's Facebook page. Now, another note you've got in here involves vines and plant growth in chimney. And I know whenever I look at a chimney and I see vegetative growth, I see plants, I see ivy, I'm envisioning all kinds of problems. So Stuart, let's tell them about the problems when they got ivy growing on the chimney. What does ivy, what does plants do? What are these roots doing that are embedded into this masonry? Well, they grow right into your mortar joints and they create avenues for all kinds of water to get inside your chimney. I mean, we all see the ivy colored uh, covered houses and we think, hey, that looks nice. I think it looks nice. And I had no clue until I came into this industry that what that thing was actually doing was destroying the masonry. I mean, it has to have something to grab to. you got a big storm and it doesn't blow off the side of your house. Why? Well, the reason is, is because it's drilling holes into the mortar. And then whenever it rains, it's given it an avenue to get in. Um, not a good idea. No, nope, because roots, I mean, we've all probably walked down a sidewalk that a tree, that something's growing through the sidewalk. All it takes is a little bitty crack 
and you get a seed into that. And then from this point, it's Katie bar the door because now we're going to grow and that's going to be part of the expansion issue. Now, as I go through this checklist, I'm seeing some of the things that we mentioned, such as this coloration, such as the effervescence. Now, here's a good one. Is there a damp, musty odor in the firebox or the basement clean out? What's that telling us, Stuart? Well, it could be telling us a couple of things. Uh, water remediation in chimneys is an, is an inexact science. Um, so you have to do a little bit of investigation, but that's either telling us that we're taking up water on high and it's draining low, or we could be in a situation that's called damp rising. If you are, uh, you know, you have a chimney at the base, the base of the chimney can actually draw water up out of the ground and into the firebox. So um, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, but um, you know, it, it, it could be either one of those. Yep. And then another one we talked about earlier is the exterior corbels, or you call it ledges against mortar joints where water can collect, pond, and seep into the wall system. So and that's, that's a, go ahead. That's a big area when you're talking about, is it in the firebox? If you go outside, generally speaking, those shoulders are not more than four or five, six feet away from your firebox. And so if your firebox is damp and musty and you have shoulders, you're probably looking at the culprit right there. Right. And when you see these exterior corbels, again, look for the discoloration. If you have water entry, usually you're going to see staining right directly below those shoulders. And that's telling you, that's what I try to teach every technician when I take them through basic training, take them through diagnostic training to be looking for the colors on the chimney. Same thing when I teach home inspectors, Stuart, I try to teach them the obvious defects that these, uh, these exterior signs tell us and point us to problems. Like I said, you're hearing Stuart and I talk about things that we know are happening inside. And see, if you're a skilled technician, you can actually look many times at the outside of the chimney. And Stuart, would you agree that we can just about predict what we're going to find if we do a video scan later? Absolutely. And, 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 and while we're talking about that, um, if you're talking about a homeowner, you don't have to be a technician uh, to walk out. If you have an external chimney, and when I say an external chimney, that's one that doesn't, you know, originate in the middle of your house. This is one where the brick actually goes down to the ground. Um, a lot of times uh, you'll see these and um, they will be in close proximity to guttering systems. And if you look where the guttering system is closest to the chimney, a lot of times you're going to see a lot of discoloration there. If you have discoloration at that point, you have a problem and that problem needs to be addressed. And I would say that not only does the way that the water uh, exits your roof need to be taken care of, but where that area is where it's splashing over and causing damage on your chimney needs to be treated to make sure that it doesn't absorb it should that happen in the future. Okay, so Stuart, let's go back to those chimneys over my shoulders. And when we look at these, you and I have already talked that those have what we would call a crown wash or a crown splay on top of them. Now, mm -hmm. the pipe that's sticking out, that's terracotta. And that terracotta pipe is extending through that crown on top. And one of the notes we have here is there should be a flexible seal that can flex because that clay pot is going, that clay is going to expand upward and downward. It's also going to get bigger and smaller. So That's is right. this a problem where we don't have that flexible sealant on a lot of chimneys and water goes right between the crown or we don't have that flexible sealant and the clay tile expands and actually cracks the chimney crown? You hit them, both of both of those are right are dead on. Um, if the if the chimney remember I said improper design, that's one of the biggest reasons that chimneys take on water. And if there was not the the correct term for that is called an expansion joint, because it does expand this way and it expands this way as it heats up and it cools down. Um, if there was not an expansion joint built into that, more than likely your crown is cracked. Um, that doesn't take very long to happen, and when that happens you get water. And if water gets down in that crack and it freezes, then that crack just keeps getting bigger. And pretty soon you're at total, uh, either total crown failure or total chimney failure, which becomes very, very expensive. Now, um, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, if the expansion joint is there, if it was built correctly, it shouldn't leak. But still, there's maintenance that needs to be done. And occasionally you'll need to use a high temp caulk around that chimney pipe just to make sure that you're not getting any leaking up there. 
Okay, so now Stuart, let's take it to some really expensive repairs that could actually mean we've got to take the chimney down or we have to do other things. A lot of chimneys create, when water comes in, the water has to drain down. So as the water drains down, sometimes it can't escape from the chimney and it goes out the actual footing or the foundation and it can wash the dirt out to where we can find a chimney that actually settles away from the house. Where you go outside and you look in the chimney and the house, there becomes this gap between the two and what it's doing is falling away at an angle. So as you look at it, that gap gets bigger and bigger as it goes up, which becomes even more of an issue. So do you agree that water entry can result in settlement issues where the chimney will actually move? Absolutely. And that's kind of one of the most heartbreaking types of damage that you can find. And the reason is, is that there's really only two things you can do at that point. Um, the first is to demolish the chimney and, and pour a new footer and start again. And, but there are other companies out there that, that have specialized equipment and products where they can actually stabilize and remove that and, and buttress that footing so that it goes back up against the house. But either one of those things is going to be very expensive. Right. So, and very true. That's what we caught. That's where it's jacked into place. And that can be difficult. And many cases can be almost impossible because as it moves, debris goes in, so they can't jack it into place. And right. again, many times to properly fix it, there's only going to be one repair. That means we're going to take the chimney down and we have to build a new chimney, dig new footings, all those kind of things. So, and one of the problems is sometimes the footings aren't deep enough. So you're sitting at a marginal failure that can happen. And this is something that happens after a number of years of the system. Now let's go to another issue here in chimneys. And that's going to be the capillary action. When we have improper drainage from landscaping, that the water will not move away from the chimney. In other words, the way the lot is landscaped, the water actually is forced to the chimney. And when we talk about a capillary action, Let's talk, tell people what we're talking about here. When the water comes up against the chimney, what happens at that point, Stuart? So the capillary action is that, the, the, you know, like I said, our eyes are imperfect instruments and they look solid to us, but it is just a series of interconnected uh, capillaries and pores. And those things, when what you're talking about then, Jerry, is you're talking about below grade and you're talking about what we call hydrostatic pressure, which means now we don't only have water but we have water with force behind it. And when that happens, the capillary structure can, I mean, it's almost like it, it sucks water in, actively sucks water in. It's almost like a vacuum sucking it like up. Like a vacuum. It's like turning on a faucet, if you will. Yeah. I mean, it I've just- actually, Yeah, Stuart, I actually had a sweep in New Jersey that went through one of my classes and they had this issue and they had tried to stop it and they said, oh, send me pictures. And they sent pictures and the the capillary action, it went all the way up a two-story structure. You wow. can see it on the second floor. Wow. We could tell the outline of where the smoke chamber was, where the firebox was. It was one of your clients too. And he went through a diagnostics class I was teaching a few years ago. And he said, Jerry, we're trying to figure this out. And we've done all these steps. And I said, well, the problem is you're landscaping, the water is being funneled directly to the chimney and the chimney is sucking the water up. And this is the things that come from experience a lot of times. This was not an inexperienced sweep, okay? When I give you, if I gave you the guy's name, you know, it would be shocking because he's well known, been doing this for years, does high quality work. But this is why education is so vastly important. Now you're point 31. And it says here, when water is applied to a visibly dried masonry, does it disappear and soak into the, into the system within a few seconds? So I'm presuming what Saver system is saying, this is a way to check the water permeates. In other words, if you wet the chimney with a garden hose and the water is sucked into the chimney, what's that telling us, Stuart? It's telling us that you need to take action before it gets expensive. Okay. Um, you know, the good part about uh, a homeowner diagnosing water problems with his chimney is that the test equipment to do that is very inexpensive. Well, a garden hose or a spray bottle. Um, if you're up top, all you need to do is spray the crown, spray the chimney, uh, hit it with a hose. 
if water is absorbed into that chimney almost immediately, you need to take some preventive action before that ends up in your home. Um, if you're dealing with a professional, they're going to have all kinds of diagnostic tools. Um, there are, are things we call masonry resorption tubes that will tell you, give you an exact uh, reading of about how much water your, your uh, chimney will take in given um, the duration or, you know, a, a 20 mile an hour driven rain, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, in the reality, these things are not necessary. Uh, the average homeowner can do it with a hose or a spray bottle. Okay. So, Stuart, you know, we go back again and my friend, your friend, John Meredith, back somewhere in the late 80s, I can't remember the exact year, came out with this material called Chimney Saver. Mm -hmm. And let's identify the materials called applying water repellents. If we apply the wrong repellent to masonry, can we actually cause the problem to worsen, Stuart? Absolutely. And that, and that, that Jerry, I got to be honest with you, man. This is, uh, you know, I'm all about helping people. And uh, this is one of the most heartbreaking things is, is when, a, when a homeowner has tried, uh, has, has understood that they had a problem, uh, probably not the magnitude of the problem they had. And they went down to the big box store and they bought something and they've sprayed it on their chimney. And then the damage that they're trying to remediate accelerates uh, and it gets expensive to fix, it's a problem. Um, when we were talking earlier about how masonry dries out and we were talking about the vapors moving through, um, you never, ever, ever want to put anything on a exterior masonry chimney that is going to block the free migration of gas vapors through, the, through that chimney. Because if you do, you will most likely accelerate the damage that you're trying to fix. Um, and, and this includes painted chimneys. We've all seen chimneys that have painted. When you paint a chimney, you take away the avenue for that brick to dry out and are almost certainly asking for... Uh, problems in the near future. And you know, paint was my next thing about people painting chimneys because when you paint it, you've actually put a barrier onto there. So okay. the moisture that gets in behind the paint and actually what we find a lot of times in the field, we find where chimneys have been painted. And if you peel the paint off, all of a sudden the brick is just, it's just crumbling behind it because it's actually accelerated the problem. So when John came out and introduced Chimney Saver, he was actually a chimney sweep there in Richmond, Indiana. So tell me this, Stuart, what makes Chimney Saver unique to solve the problem of water entry into masonry materials? Okay, um, let me backtrack for a second and I'll get right to that. But the other thing I was going to say is that, you know, when people, I just want to get this because people that paint chimneys sometimes don't understand when you talk about, you know, if you painted a chimney and you could paint that chimney and you could guarantee that that envelope, because that's what you've done is put an envelope over your chimney. If you could guarantee that that envelope would remain intact throughout the life of the chimney, you would be fine. But the problem is, is that one little crack and water starts going in it and it never comes back out and it always gets stuck in there and then you end up with what you're talking about with the brick crumbling when you take the paint off. So um, I just wanted to backtrack to that. But given why is Chimney Saver the preferred product of professionals and why has it been the preferred product of professionals for the last 40 years? The reason is, is because Chimney Saver is a proprietary modified siloxane. And what this actually does is it coats the pore and the capillary structure that we've been talking about, and it changes the incidence angle at which water is absorbed. And Jerry, I know that you've seen this before, but you can spray this stuff on a brick and you can let it dry. And when you feel the brick, you won't feel a coating on it because there is no coating. It absorbs in and it coats that capillary structure. But if you put water on the brick, it'll dance around in little bubbles like a wax car. Am I right? That's correct. And, you know, years ago, one of the things we used to have, and I should have went and got them because I got a couple sitting right here in my office, but I don't have them right here, is we used to have these little miniature concrete blocks, you know, and I don't know if y'all still sell those little blocks. We, we do. Used, okay. So anyway, what we would do is you take two of those blocks and you just split them apart slightly where there's a little gap. And then you put drops of water on top of that. And the water didn't go between the, it didn't go down in that gap between those blocks. 
And the way John explained at that time, he, he used the term comparison to North and South Pole magnets, where a North Pole magnet and a South Pole magnet, when you push them together, they're going to force themselves apart. So what he said was it was very similar to that, to a magnetic action, that the water will not go into the crack. It's actually repelling it from going into the crack. Am I remembering this correctly? You are. And, and what I would also say is that chimney saver actually works in, in two ways. The first is you put it on and it dries. And then over the next three days to seven or eight to 10 days, depending on how much sunshine you have, then it actually cures. The UV radiation from the sun actually cures it and it forms a permanent chemical bond with the silica and the mineral and metallic salts inside of that structure. Um, and so that's a reason why that this product will last for a good 10 years before you have to reapply it. It's also the reason why when you use a product that forms a film, not a good idea for reasons that we've already talked about, but a doubly bad idea when you stop and think about that thing that you put on the outside of your chimney is now going to be available to the UV rays of the sun, you know, for as long, you know, 12 hours a day or however long the sun shines during the day. And that UV ray is actually going to, once it cures, it actually starts degrading it. And that's the only reason that chimney saver lasts for 10 years is because it's actually inside and it takes a lot longer for that to degrade. When you put something on the surface, the UV rays of the sun will break it down much quicker. And so a, uh, a coating uh, for external masonry usually will last anywhere from two to five years. Okay. So one of the things Jesse just added a comment, another good thing about chimney saver is it allows the moisture to get out, which was also, and John, we used to use the term, and I don't know if you still do it, but it's vapor permeable. In other 90, words, 96.8% as proven by ASTM testing. Okay, so let me ask you this, Stuart. Do we, uh, do we approach waterproofing of concrete block, you know, modular units of concrete block, and do we approach it and brick as the same, or is there a difference in treating those two materials? Trick question. They're both treated the same way, but with different products. Okay. And like we said earlier, uh, block and, and, and um, you know, depending on what type of block you're talking about, um, they have different pore and capillary structures. And so what you have to do is you have to use products. If you're going to coat those, you have to use products that have different molecular sizes because the gaps and the cracks in there are a lot bigger. So we make products specifically for block chimneys and we make products specifically for brick chimneys. Okay, so good. And that's what I was getting at. I don't know, maybe that came out when I said I was talking about the different materials, even though it probably didn't come out that way. We're still applying it in the same mannerism that's being sprayed on those type of things. So and let so, me ask you this. Let me, and, let, me, let me caveat real quick. The sure. caveat is, is that if you use the product for brick on a block chimney, the molecule size in it is, is too small to be effective long term but you're still probably going to get half life out of it. You know, you're going to get three to five years. It's not like it's going to do anything. It's just not going to last as long as it should. Okay. So in your product line of chimney saver, you actually have carriers and we have one that is the, the chemical is actually a water-based product. On the other, it is a solvent mineral-based product. You've actually got the active ingredients, but something's got to carry. It's just like if you have paint, in a can, there's only, there's a little bit of pigment, but you got to have something to carry that pigment and put it there. So what's the difference between using solvent-based and using water-based chimney saver on masonry materials? Okay, quick quick history lesson. Yes. Um, I was born in 1960, 1960. I was going to say 67 to give myself seven extra years, but uh, I was born in 1960. And back in those days, everything was solvent. Um, if you open the can and it didn't about knock you over, then people thought that it wasn't a very good product. But as we learned that these things are not that good for the environment, there was a lot of research that went into water-based. Now, if you're dealing with paint, <clears throat> all the paint back in the old days used to be solvent-based paint or oil-based paint. It's the same thing. Um, but then they started doing acrylic, which is water-based. 
And uh, for our listeners that are old enough to remember, acrylic paints used to be <laughs> absolutely, I'm, I'm there too, Jerry, uh, used to be absolutely horrible. They didn't last, they peeled, blah, blah, blah. But over the last 40 years, all the research and development has gone into water-based paints as the EPA has regulated out the use of a lot of solvent-based things. And so I would posit to you that water-based products, especially in the, in the, in the weatherproofing industry, are as good, if not better, than solvent-based products. Now, there are some reasons that we might use a solvent-based product, but they are limited. Okay, so we can do a satisfactory job with a water-based material. It's actually probably better for the installer. It's probably better for the environment. Is that what I'm hearing you say, Stuart? That's exactly what I'm saying. Okay, that's what I mean. That's what I heard. I just want to confirm what I heard there because it is, you know, it's just a different whole thing and it is part of the world today as we go through. So, Stuart, what else would you add to this broadcast today to consumers about water entry? Like I said, we started this off and we have plainly stated, you and I both agree that water entry is probably the most hazardous material to masonry materials that we presently encounter. It's bigger hazard than chimney fires, overheating and those kind of things. So what is there any other advice from your aspect that you would add to our listeners today? I want, I just want to reiterate um, that the best thing that a homeowner can possibly do is to take preventive action. Don't wait until you have a problem to treat the problem. You know, or you should know, if you've listened to this podcast, that water remediation in a masonry chimney is the number one reason that that chimney will fail. And if you take preventative action before the water actually gets into your space, then it's going to be pennies for dollars because once it gets into your space, and you get black mold, you get rotting framing members, you get deteriorating drywall, then not only do you have to fix the water remediation problem, but you have to fix the problems that it created as well. So get in front of the curve, get your stuff treated, and never have to deal with these problems. That's correct, because water is a very damaging thing. I mean, I'm sitting here right now, Stuart. I don't know if you can hear the construction noise right there, but our master bathroom had a small leak. So right now we've had to tear, I mean, we've had to tear the whole bathroom out for this little bitty leak because guess where it was? Right under the shower, right under the towel. And that's what commonly happens because if you have this water coming in, it can communicate to the framing members of the house. And if it communicates to the framing members, that means you're going to have rot, you're going to have mildew, you're going to have softened uh, wall boards, sheet rock, drywall, whatever you want to call it. Right. Right. You're going to have all kinds of problems in the system out there. Okay. And like my, there you go. See what my wife just added, Cheryl, been, it's been a lot of fun. Okay. Been a lot of fun because we've had water damage from two different aspects, one in the bathroom and the basement got flooded. So my new studios down here, this was flooded territory not too long ago. So anyway, the whole thing is listen to what Stuart said. You need to take these preventative measures and the preventative measures means if you don't have the proper crown, get it on before the damage occurs. You can also buy overhanging chimney caps. Many years ago, I actually developed a cap that's got, that has an overhang to simulate that in the cap system and different people sell these around the country. And the, my whole thinking was we need something that can simulate this overhang. So different people came out with that. Owens Chimney makes them, they call them the chimney helmet. Copperfield makes them, they call them the, you know, uh, got, I forgot what they call theirs, but all these different things. So most of your chimney sweeps in the country can sell these preventative measures. Getting the chimney waterproof, getting it done before the damage, before the damage start. Is that a good idea, Stuart, to waterproof a masonry chimney before there's any problems? Go ahead and apply that. Is that a great preventative measure? If I, if I, if, if you can do anything, that's the best thing. And can I add a shameless plug here, Jerry? 
you can sh you can shamelessly plug away, but you got to remember what I told you earlier. Okay, so keep going. <laughs> All right, so I'm just gonna say, if you're not a do-it-yourselfer and you're not comfortable getting on your roof, you should have your appliance or your burning situation checked out at least once a year by a certified chimney specialist. And if you do find that you have water remediation problems, or if you want to get ahead of the curve and do preventive maintenance, make sure that he's using Chimney Saver branded products. If you're a do-it-yourselfer and you want to do it yourself, we make a do-it-yourself line. It's branded under the Chimney RX brand, and you can find those online. But either way, take care of it before it becomes a bigger problem. And well, thank you, Jerry, for putting on this show. Right. So I also want to keep you this, okay? You know... Stuart, I've climbed on roofs for many years, okay? And this is where I'm at in this world, okay? Because there's a lot, I'm not getting any younger, okay? And as you both know, I had some health yeah. issues a couple months ago. And one of the things that I had to promise myself is, Stuart, I've made my last trip on my roof, okay? It's not that I can't climb my roof, but my God, I'm not going to get hurt. And there are too many people that get hurt from ladders. I just did a show yesterday with the son of the guy that invented the little giant ladder system. And, you know, a lot of times when you look at it, we're wanting to do something. And I, I just want people to know there are experts that get hurt on ladders. So if you're going to get up there as a do-it-yourselfer, you better be aware, you know, falling Gravity wins. You ever notice that? You ever notice that when you fall, Stuart, that gravity will always win? I'm not trying to scare anybody, but the body reaches terminal, terminal velocity at eight feet. Correct. If you're so, not a climber. Yeah. So, yeah, Stuart's not as old as I am, but before long, Stuart's going to have to face the same decision, which is he's too over the hill to be climbing on ladders any longer. You ready for that one, Stuart? I, I, I'm almost there, Jerry. I really am. <laughs> you're you're seven, eight years behind me, brother. So, you know, it's coming there. It's whatever. It's like, you know, wearing glasses or whatever. You think it'll never hit you. And then all of a sudden you get in your 40s, you go blind and other things. So anyway, I was earlier. So, Stuart, I really want to thank you for coming on the show today. This is the second time Stuart has been on this show with me. Previously, we talked about creosote treatment chemicals. And I want to remind also, if you're in the industry, we do this show to help you educate your customers. And one of the best ways you can do that is consider sharing our broadcast. The Fireplace Show is not just do it. The people that are listening to this, these homeowners, I don't buy your product. Do I? When's the last time I bought Chimney Saver, Stuart? You can't even remember when, right? I cannot. Okay, I don't have. Well, I'm. The, I am not in the business any longer. The reason we do this show is to help consumers understand chimneys, understand fireplaces. Uh, just this morning, Stuart, I had a real estate agent in California, and he asked, "Can I share your stuff?" Because I got a lot of customers and a lot of people, and I can understand the way that you guys explain this to me. Just like I told you coming in. We're talking to consumers. We want people to understand that we're speaking to. So if you're in the industry and you are watching this, this is what we would ask you to do. Consider sharing this on your own social pages and getting the word out because our mission in doing the Fireplace Show is to help you explain to your customers what's going on and how to help them further. Stuart, anything you want to add before we shut out of here today? The only other thing I want to say is that Saber Systems has a full team of technicians, 800-860-6327. We are the We Fix Leaky Chimneys people. If you have any questions, please give us a call, 800-860-6327. We'll be happy to help you. And Stuart, y'all can recommend a competent user of their product in their market area. Would that be true? We have an extensive database, and if you think you have an issue and you want a competent person to take a look at it, please call that number, 800-860-6327, and we will give you, uh, we don't pick and choose, we can give you all the people in your area that we're aware of that do a good job, and uh, you can pick your own contractor. Okay. Well, Stuart, 
I got some more subject matters later on. I want to get you, I'm going to invite you back as a guest in the future. You ready to come back on at a future one? If you got your computer working right next time, man, you know it. You're not going to get a brand new computer before we go on a broadcast again. Are you? I am not. Who who would know that Apple did not work with this program? I tell you what, at, at 4:26 this evening, that man on this screen was going ballistic because we couldn't get him in. So I that's why I started this show without him, and then all of a sudden he showed up down in the bottom screen. So again, my name is Jerry Eisenhower. My company is CBC Success Group. And we educate, we coach, we work within the chimney service industry, the hearth industry, the fireplace industry, and the home inspection industry. So we're here. If we can help you in your business, reach out to us at info at cbcsuccessgroup.com. And we look forward to hearing from you and keep watching. We're going to keep coming out. We have a whole, we started doing this show some months ago. And again, the whole purpose of this show is to help the consumers of America better understand their fireplaces, their chimneys, and the problems they have. And hopefully, Stuart, maybe we can help save a life. Maybe we can help save some property in putting on this show, sir. So I appreciate you being here. And I'll see everybody on the next episode of The Fireplace Show by CBC Success Group. Thanks for joining us. It's an honor, it's a privilege, and it's a pleasure, my friends.